So welcome. My name is Brian Bridwell. I'm a principal UX designer at Ramp Group, um, Ramp Group Technologies, and I'm going to be um, kind of walking you through um, things from a design perspective. I have worked at uh, companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Stanford, um, General Motors, and uh, and I'm here to kind of help from the design standpoint uh, of user experience. Mark. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, yeah, my name is Mark Libran. I'm a senior consultant with CodeSmart. Um, I do web development work mostly on the Microsoft stack, but in the evening I like to get my node on. Um, I work mostly for government agencies, um, and I, I'm here to handle the development side of things. Right on. Excellent. So um, we are basically here, the purpose of today's webinar is to show how responsive design works and um, how we can help your team approach it, um, approach the task of either creating or revamping your current uh, your current presence. Um, sometimes we'll be using the word website. Um, it's not necessarily the case, so we're calling it presence, um, all sorts of stuff. So we'll um, start the presentation. Okay. So here's basically what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to go into uh, basically how um, you know what responsive design is, why we want to use it. Uh, we're going to talk about um, going from uh, ground up, revamping a site, um, the solution, and uh, what responsive design is versus adaptive design. Um, we're going to be talking about types of uh, responsive sites, etc. cetera. Um, designers and devs living in harmony, um, mobile first, what it means, and frameworks and CSS. Um, so this is basically aimed at people who are, uh, we're going to have a, a, probably a broad range of people here. There are some people who are brand new to responsive design, and there are going to be people who are, um, who are using it already and are um, and just pick, wanting to pick up kind of a new direction. So we're going to have kind of a wide range. This is a, it's a 45-minute session, so this is going to be a very um, high-level um, session, but Basically, we're going to try to get into some of the some of the meat as we go, um, and we are um, happy to help you. And uh, Ramp Group and CodeSmart, who we both work for, and, and we're sister companies, um, we're happy to. Um, when we're finished with this thing, if you have more questions, you can ask them. We're going to have questions at the end, and we're going to offer a free uh, two hours free of help to get your uh, the rest of your team on board and to help you put a plan together as to um, going responsive. Okay, so what is responsive design? Um, it's basically, um, it's a way of uh, putting together um, a, a display of content in different formats so that, um, so that that same content will flow into different devices and resolutions and be able to show, um, you know, in a fluid um, direction. So Ethan Marcote, who we'll talk about in a little bit, um, was the one who coined the term and put this together. And basically, um, he's kind of the father of this whole process. So Mark and I are going to go back and forth a little bit. We're going to talk about why we want to use responsive design. Um, pretty much everybody knows right now that the mobile uh, mobile devices have grown dramatically and so there's a there are a lot of people who are uh, now using uh, mobile devices more so than um, desktops to actually view their their uh, um, web material uh, they have many different uh, display resolutions and uh, it also allows uh, mobile growth also allows people to take their their site with them so they can actually go out and uh, use it while they're out in the field that's very important for uh, you know our demographic, who we're trying to reach. Uh, we also have the other reason we want to use it uh, to target multiple devices with one code base. So basically, your content is, uh, you know, you're, you're basically using the same content. You're displaying it different ways, and you're using CSS. You're using um, different code to actually like put it together for different devices. It's easier to maintain. Um, which is also why we save time and money managing your site. We're basically going out and um, having the editing be a job for content people and the display of that uh, be a job for devs and designers. And and this is Mark. We, we realize the one code base is an ideal that you strive for. You, it, depending on the project that you're working on, 
you obviously know that that may not always be something that you can achieve, but it's what you work towards. Exactly. And uh, the, the, the last point here, when you're basically, you're trying to create a very useful UI, that's the user interface that's gonna go work on mobile devices and tablets and uh, you know desktop computers and large screens, you end up really looking at the design in a different way. And your focus is to try to make that design um, translate between the different devices. And so what this does is it'll, it actually makes your design cleaner and stronger um, because you've tested on different things. Okay, so this is just a, a lot of um, studies have said that right now there's been a turning point where there are more people actually using mobile devices to, to browse than using desktops. Um, it's just what we do. And for specific apps, depending on what you do, uh, that's probably even more the case. So if you have, for example, One Bus Away, which is, a, which is a, an application so that you can actually go out and find out when your bus is coming and where it comes from, um, the majority of people who are actually using that application are using it on their mobile device. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about about mobile design uh, a little bit and about how responsive design works. So what we have is um, we have a change. Basically, the, the responsive design changes the presentation of the content fluidly to fit any device on the screen. So here is an example of uh, a mosaic layout. Um, think of the content as tiles. So they rearrange based on the device types and uh, device screen size. So Pinterest is a good example. And I'm going to scoot over to that for a second. Okay, so here's Pinterest. And Pinterest basically works oops, in a similar way. Grab my side. So that when you actually like, bring the screen down, the tiles actually rearrange themselves. So this is one type of responsive design. There are, there are many different ones. And this allows you to see it in a different type of application. Looks like that's all it goes to at this point. And be able to actually rearrange the content. Content doesn't change. It's just the presentation does. Any questions on that? Great. So let's talk a little bit about fluid versus fixed design. So the, the a fixed design is basically a design, um, I'll read this. The design is housed in a fixed width container. So this can be measured in pixels or percentages. Um, Fix, uh, fluid design is something that actually adapts. So the design is in a container and adjusts to screen resolutions. So you usually measure this in percentages and for fonts you can measure it in EMs. And what's basically going on here is the proportions stay the same in a fluid design when you um, move, when you get a smaller resolution or a larger resolution. With a fixed design, it stays the same. This is very similar to print versus the web. So in a print, um, in a print piece, Designers usually didn't worry about um, colors um, as far as how many they had. Um, file size, they didn't worry so much about um, constraints because they had to control and how that was viewed. In the web, because uh, browser sizes change, things would, uh, they would have limitations. They wouldn't be able to have the file size. So as far as that analogy goes, the fixed size is actually something that stays, it, it's done in pixels. It usually remains a, a, an exact size and fluid changes as things go. Okay, so here's a fixed width piece on the left. You'll see that they're fixed pixels. Everything's measured in, um, you know, in, in their sizes. And in the fluid piece, you have percentages. So things will change, but the proportions will stay the same based on where you are. I'm going to show you one example of that really quick. And here is a site that is a fixed site. So when you move in on this, nothing changes. Basically, it you will reveal more of the screen or less of the screen. There are advantages to this, but um, you know, in that you can control exactly how the content looks. No one can change it. 
The problem is that when you end up looking at a small device, you end up scrolling. You only see part of the page. Or it ends up being extremely small, if that's the case. And so that's a, a very poor user experience. So the Boston Globe is a really good example of um, one of the earliest sites, um, large sites, um, that was uh, changed to a responsive site, converted by Ethan Marcotte. And um, he's kind of the, uh, the, as I said, the father of this. So um, the goal here is to basically take that content. So you saw it in the previous slide where we have a, um, a mobile device changing that content. So it's not just shrinking it, it's actually showing in, um, in kind of a different um, size to fit that device. So this is basically turned to a one column versus a two column in the um, tablet, three column in, in all other cases. Mark, did you want to add anything? Um, uh, I can't think of anything to add at this point. Okay. I'll come in, I'll come in soon, don't worry. <laughs> Lonely. Uh, Prashant, you had a question. Let me unmute you. Hey, Prasant, you had a question? I guess not. Okay. So let's see. So let's go to the next slide. All right. So um, a lot of these, a lot of these pieces that you'll see that are, are thrown on Apple devices <laughs> works with all sorts. So basically, trading trading your content to put it in so that it'll show best on whichever device it is doesn't matter what it's showing on because you're already focused on um, the fluidity of it. Okay. So where do you start? So a lot of you guys are starting with a new. Um, you're starting with a new site. Um, some of you are actually doing revamps of current sites to try to make them more current and adaptive. Um, so first place to start, we're going to talk about um, where team fits in and the considerations you have for a team, and then um, actually, you know, building that site, um, you know, how it works. So as far as the team goes, here are some of the team players. You have you uh, user experience or UX designers. These are the these are the designers that figure out. Um, kind of where things sit on the screen, um, how the um, how the whole user experience works. They are looking at this from a user perspective. Developers, front end and back end developers. So the front end are, are basically dealing with uh, making sure that the UX designers' um, evil plans are actually uh, maintained, and uh, the back end are dealing with the data and, and all the things that that um, we enjoy but never see. Um, Information architects are uh, people who basically focus on how the structure works of of you know of the site and how um, you know where things actually sit on the page. What is what are best practices? How things actually sit in a hierarchy so they make sense for the user. And project man project managers, of course, um, they pull everything together. It's really important when you have a team especially with responsive design, for everyone to be on the same page, for everyone to understand what it is that, um, that they're trying to um, accomplish together so that there's good communication and people don't step on each other's um, directions. Okay. So websites versus web applications. So there, um, websites um, are... You know, websites are more informational in nature. Um, so what we basically tend to do when we're looking at websites, when we're looking at something from like a desktop perspective, for example, um, that's when that's when we fill out our forms. That's when we work on things that are um, uh, that we need more screen real estate for. Um, it's kind of the it's kind of the, the things that we work on that we don't want to be, it's input based. So we, we have a keyboard, we want to use things, and this is where we use it. Web apps are more about um, interaction and information processing. So basically, when you have a web app and you go out and start using it, um, you can actually have a different sort of input. You have your, um, you are actually more on site and can use, you know, different, um, different things to, to get your, uh, you know, to use that data. So when you're filling out forms, you're generally not doing that, you know, from a mobile perspective. It's a bad user uh, experience. You're focused on doing kind of the busy work and the research work, reading articles, that kind of thing, you know, more from a website perspective. 
and obviously many of your this is Mark again. Um, obviously many of your web presences are going to be like some hybrid hybrid combination of these things, um, and especially when taking into consideration that you're targeting um, other devices, like especially mobile phones, because there's because they're so limited in kind of the way the interaction happens with it. That's it, probably going to be a good opportunity to see are there ways that you can better divide that content between even more so demarcating better those lines between what is the website portion of your application and what is the application portion of your application. Every but everything obviously is going to depend on the project that you're that you're working on at a given time. Makes total sense. Um, so we had uh, we had one question from Hill. Is uh, is RESTful API on Google Cloud Endpoint considered a web application? Well, uh, this is Mark. Uh, sure, RESTful API would be considered an application. However, since since the RESTful API is really a programmatic in, in, um, interface, I don't know that I don't know that you necessarily have to take at least as far as the API part of it's concerned. I don't, know, I don't know that you have to take a whole lot of consideration with whether that um, needs to have any kind of responsiveness to it. Um, the responsive part with the, with an API are going to be the things that consume that API. So whatever application you have consuming those RESTful endpoints, that's that's the part where you're going to start consider, taking into consideration, you know, whether you want to go responsive or adaptive, kind of how you need to divide that application up. Excellent. Okay, so let's talk um, websites. Mark, why don't you hit this one? Okay. Yeah, um, so websites, because of their informational nature, they're great low-hanging fruit. It, um, it, there's, there are a lot of methodologies already out there for how to set up content on, uh, on a web page so that it does, so that it does reorganize itself depending on what kind of, what kind of device it's, it's on. Um, those tools and methodologies are widely available, and they've been around for a long time, relatively speaking. So that the ecosystem that's there is very mature. People have, you know, thought and rethought and argued about about the best ways to do things, and they've implemented a whole lot of tool sets that are really well developed and and ready for you to just start implementing. Um, and there's, you know, there's not generally speaking very many um, considerations that you have to take into to, that you that you have to take in that you have to have in mind. Um, with regard to how the users are interacting with it, other than consuming that information, and as I said, that you know those that tooling is is pretty well developed. Um, some challenges that you're going to come up with the website, uh, you know, are on those interaction pieces. Um, you know, you, the search is going to be a challenge. And when I say challenge, I'm not saying that it's like this really impossible thing. Again, you know, people have been working on search, so there's solutions out there. But these are the these are going to when compared to presenting the information on different devices, the things that are going to be more challenging than, than just that presentation are going to be, you know, how do you have people search in a desktop? How do you have people search when they're on a, on a, um, a more limited area? Do you take advantages of some of the capabilities that, that mobile devices have, like the ability to do voice search? How, do, how could you implement that if you, wanted to, if you wanted to have that as part of your, your mobile initiative? Um, the next thing, navigation, you know, how the, menu, how the menuing systems work. But it's obviously a much different experience when you're sitting at a desktop using menus and you've got a mouse to, to point and click your way through at, than when you're using touch and swiping and that kind of thing. So, you know, the navigation, you've got like opportunities there. Well, you've got like think, considerations that you, have to that you have to take into account to make sure that, it, that the navigation is useful and usable from from a mobile standpoint, but you also got like these opportunities that you can that you can look and maybe introduce some of those mobile concepts into the navigation of your site. And some of the tooling even takes care of, uh, care of that. So if you look at some of the frameworks out there, they'll have like transitions and, and swiping things that you can actually pretty easily implement on on a website. Um, the final thing that's that that's going to be more challenging than just the content is any kind of multimedia that you're that you're presenting on um, on your website. So anything that's uh, even photos, right? You're going to need to make sure that they that they size appropriately, and once they get down to like a certain factor, and it becomes ridiculous for them to continue sizing, do you start like not showing them or a different version of them? Um, videos, videos are another thing that you have to take into consideration, and audio may be something that you need to take a look at. Um, awesome. Okay. So web applications. Let me do this one too. Yeah, we, yeah, we do it together. Okay, so web applications again. Web applications. Um, 
they're really focused on having the people uh, provide information, process information, um, and get like results from the from the input that they're providing to the web application. Depending on how complex that interaction is, the, one of the first questions you're going to want to ask with with a web application that you, especially if you're if we're talking about revamping a web application, you've got like this web application that you develop for desktop users. You have to ask yourself: Is it realistic to make it mobile ready, or is or is the amount of interactions, the type of interactions, is it just really going to make that a painful experience? Depending on on whether you're on another device. Um, you're also going to want to look at the types of interactions that you're having in your application. Can those be easily translated to typical mobile interactions, right? So you can, can so, so the things that are really easy to do on mobile are stuff like touch, swipes, pinching. Um, you know, can can those be if any any kind of interactions that you can translate to that kind of interaction, as opposed to stuff that requires you to use a mouse or a keyboard? You know, those are going to be big wins if you can look at, when you're looking at your application on how to convert it. Um, and the other thing that you're really going to want to take a, take a look at with your web applications, are there things that in that application that could totally benefit from the different capabilities that you've got on a mobile device, right? So when you're on a mobile device, you've got your GPS, you've got a camera, you've got a scanner, you've got other kinds of sensors. Um, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the gyroscopic sensors could help you on a form, but you know, it, those are the those are the kind of opportunities you're going to look at to see if you can make the user experience even better for people who are on a mobile device. So I work with Amazon, and we actually had uh, one of the questions. Actually, one of the questions we had was, um, "Can you please show any of uh, an example of any web apps?" So I'll give you an example, um, uh, and we'll we'll show one in a second here as well. Uh, Am at Amazon, they have something called uh, Amazon Trade-In. So when you were in college, you used to trade in your books and, and get money for them, you know, and buy pizza at the end of your semester. Um, Amazon Trade-In lets you um, do the same thing with iPads and cameras and, you know, um, books, all, all sorts of things. And um, one of the things that was nice about having that web app, as Mark said, that made it a big win was being able to have a camera or a scanner that could actually like scan in the item that you were going to trade in. So you showed what the item was like. Uh, imagine, you know, going to eBay and actually putting items up and being able to use your phone to do the whole, the whole transaction. It's kind of a helpful, helpful thing. So here... We'll, we'll talk responsive versus adaptive, and we'll get into the adaptive in a second. An example that also gives it the uh, uh, the web app as well. So responsive web design basically it changes uh, to you know it fluidly changes the content to fit that size of the the device or the screen, and uh, adaptive will change to fit a prearranged set of devices or screens. So again, it's not a question of which one is the way to the way to go. It's which one, the better way to go. It's which one is the better way to go for your content for your um, application. So right, and when you're yeah. And when you're doing it, you'll you'll I think you'll often find that you know, the informational website stuff is really easy to implement with responsive web design and can benefit greatly from it. And a lot of times, I think with the applications, you're going to find yourself at least at least for part of it having to rely on you know, the adaptive nature, where you know given given you're on a different device, you direct them to like a different version of the the experience. Excellent. Um, we also also had a question: Is responsive design native to cross-platform motive development tools? Uh, like uh, Xamarin or PhoneGap, or is it something that you need to think of separately? Um, well, Xamarin, Xamarin, and tools like Xamarin, they compile, they down compile. I, I'm pretty sure they down compile into like actual native apps, right? So you take you code your you code your stuff up in Xamarin, and it down compiles into like a. a a Android native app and, and and then the iOS ones down down uh, they transcompile into into an iOS app. Whereas like PhoneGap, that's kind of a framework with um, HTML content like kind of within it. So the framework allows that allows that web application to kind of interface more tightly with 
the data device, but the content within it is still going to be essentially an HTML page. So there, the so there, the responsiveness, the the responsive design or the adaptive design, these concerns that we're talking about with web applications, they again make sense even within that even within that phone gap kind of model. They're not going to make as much sense when we're talking about things that are actually going to be native apps. But the considerations that you're going to make about you know when you're looking at your application and deciding whether you're going to go for a mobile version of that application, the kind of interaction that people are going to take with the, with that application, that, that still applies, right? So if you're going to, even if you were going to build a native Android app, you're still going to have to like look at what your existing application is and say, okay, these people are going to be on a smartphone, right? So what can I realistically have them do in this native app? How can, how can I have them interact with this without breaking down in tears? Um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Awesome. So um, Wikipedia is is you know one of the examples we have of adaptive adaptive solutions. So this is base this is the same site. It's the same content, but what's happening is the um, the content on kind of on the, on the mobile format is actually a little bit different than the desktop. And so what's basically happening is. In the um, in the mobile version, you will see that they have um, they have a little bit. Again, you have this uh, this one piece last edited 22 hours ago. It doesn't have it over on the on the other version. So it's just taken at the same time. Um, there are there's a hamburger menu. So basically, your navigation can shrink down. You'll notice there's there's navigation all here. Uh, a left nav that can get you into different places, and it's simplified with the hamburger. These little three lines that basically are your uh, is your your menu that will slide out or pull down or drop over. That's uh, that's typically called the the hamburger. And you'll also see that there are um, icons that are replacing text sometimes. Uh, so they're they're there actually to save space and make things um, easier to you know easier to use on a in a mobile setting. Um, when you're using things like uh, icons or buttons on in a mobile device, you need to be thinking about what they call the uh, fat finger syndrome. So you need to make sure that things are big enough for people to push and not too close to something else. So when they try to push one thing, they push another. Um, so and and there are versions here where it's a two column versus a one column, um, but basically you're handling this two different ways. You know, one is a desktop version and one's a mobile. And and while you know while Wikipedia made the decision to like actually support this this you know this adaptive bifurcating their their audience into one going to the mobile device if they're on a mobile device and the other going to this desktop version this this effect the stuff that he, all the stuff that he's pointing out here can can be done with responsive libraries right you can have you could do this fully responsive if you wanted to you could have the one site and then based on the rules that we'll talk about a little bit later you can actually make all of those things happen depending on the type of device they're coming in but you know it's something that you're going to take a look at when you're trying to organize your project you know how you know what, what's your time frame what's your budget what kind of support are you going to have for it afterwards those are the things you're going to have to take into consideration which and wikipedia that, that's almost certainly what the, the kind of the things that wikipedia talked about when they made the decision to go with this adaptive approach of having the two sites So let's say, uh, so we have two directions here. One is revamping a current project, and the other is creating a new project. So these are basic steps that you want to go through when you're creating a new project. Um, one question is, do you want this to be a website or a web app, as we discussed? Um, that's important. Um, another one is, from a UX perspective, you want to ask, you want to make assumptions. They used to call them um, business rules, where basically your CEO or the project manager says, this, these, this is what you need to create for the site. This is how it needs to go. These are your business rules. And the more modern way of thinking of it is these um, are assumptions. We make those business rules, we call them assumptions, and we test them with users. So the idea is to go out and check to make sure before you start building anything whether this is the right direction to go. Um, is this what users want? Do they understand how it's implemented? Usability studies are things where you go out and ask. You know, they can be focus groups. They can be. Um, you can show paper prototypes. You can actually have a lab where you stand behind the one the one way glass and shock people when they do the wrong thing. Whatever you want to do, um, uh, getting user feedback is important. Um, 
it also, you know, also when you're creating this new project, you want to make sure that developers and designers are thinking in the same page. They need to be focused on the same goals and how they're going to achieve them. And then they need to discuss it with the client just to make sure that, um, you know, designers and developers discuss the way they're going to handle a problem. So before they, they hit with a client, they're not having an argument basically saying, well, we can't do that. Yes, we can do that. Um, figure it out beforehand. Um, another thing to keep in, uh, keep in mind is uh, keep breakpoints in mind. So breakpoints are basically where, where the content changes from, you know, one view to another view. So you're, you're got a mobile, a mobile view, it stretches out, it goes to a tablet, it stretches out, it goes to a desktop. Um, breakpoints are things that some people design by. They say these are the, the breakpoints you want for different devices. But what really determines where you break things and where they, that design actually changes a little bit or your tables change um, is uh, columns, et cetera, is with um, content. Your content, where it looks bad, that's where you need to um, make a change. And finally, um, point that, yeah. Uh, uh, just, uh, just a little insertion here. Breakpoints with respect to web applications um, as opposed to websites and, and just simply content. Um, the the breakpoints and those I'm putting I'm doing the air quotes the breakpoints for web applications are going to be you know on each individual device what kind of inter again what kind of interactions make sense on that device so there you know there may be like this full blown application that you have that you present to desktop users where they've got um, you know large large tables of data with in in table inline editing and like all kinds of graphs that show up in different parts and you got like this whole single page application experience going on um, whereas on a tablet because of the more limited um, input capabilities maybe you don't have like the inline editing you have to like approach you have to approach the input from a different different perspective um, because of the screen real estate and the the ability of it to, to really handle those different panels because you got lower um, you've got lower processing capability maybe you don't show like the 15 columns of different panels of information all showing up at the same time. You show a more limited subset with ways to get to the other to the other portions of that. And then maybe on a on a on a smartphone, it just simply doesn't make any sense whatsoever to interact with the data, and you provide just simply a read-only version. So, and those those will kind of correspond to the breakpoints that people that that the developers talk about with regard to um, web content as opposed to like web applications. And that's what we also mean by functionality for each device. I mean, you're, you're figuring out what you're going to use that device for. And if you think about, uh, you think about a desktop version of, of your um, project as a piano and the mobile version as a harmonica, they both have their own value, but you can't do all the things you can do on, you know, one that you could do on the other. Um, also, uh, we got a question. Tom, Tom uh, asked, uh, shock people when they do the wrong thing. Uh, I don't think they do that anymore. It's just a joke. Uh, but, uh, you know, get the wrong peanut and you get the shock. But I don't think they do that at Microsoft anymore. I could be wrong. So when you're, when you're um, starting to work on a site and you're putting together your, your um, designs, you want to kind of storyboard the thing to say, well, here's how the design's going to work in one format versus another you you basically whiteboard it. You can do wireframes, all sorts of things, and they can show all different ways. You can also use those to do um, paper prototyping. So here's a really cool thing. This is uh, this is from Shopify, and what Shopify has is a template that you can use um, to actually create your um, your content and how it's going to move from one device to another. It's very similar to how an animator would, would use um, kind of a template for doing the storyboarding. Does that make sense? With that, you can actually go out and do paper prototyping. So you can do, you can paper prototype. Basically what that is, is all, it's just their drawings or printouts or a PowerPoint or whatever you want to show. And you hand those to users. It's extremely inexpensive to do. You can take your assumptions that we talked about and prove them or disprove them. So you have five assumptions that you make. These are what users want. You find out three of them are really solid and that's what they want. One of them needs some tweaking and they may have, um, one of them doesn't work at all and they may have a couple of examples that can add to what you're doing. The, the, my, my favorite phrase uh, that UX designers use are, you are not the user. 
okay? We work with the programs that we create. We work with the websites we create. We understand from a back end how these things work. Users do not necessarily, and so we can't assume that we know what the user wants because they may not see things the same way we do. So doing these paper prototypes is a really good way before you start any development to basically get some of those questions answered before you start. It saves a ton of money and it gets you a lot closer to the, um, to the target. And as a developer, you know, I don't do pretty. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind about like paper prototyping and like and, and drawing up your, your ideas, ugly is okay. It's better to do it often than to than to try and do it pretty. So don't worry about don't worry about your artistic skills. Um, just do it as often as you can. Yes. And when you make a mistake on paper, it's just fine. It's uh, easy to just crumple it up and throw it away. Exactly. I'm 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 there too. Although I'm all about pretty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, oh, so you creative. <laughs> You'll know the slides that are marks because he calls them um, he calls us creatives. Um, so we just talked about creating a new site, um, but uh, my guess is that a lot of a lot of the people who are calling in are um, already have a project that they're working on and they want to update it. They want it to get to a point where it's more modern, it's more usable, and it can reach more people. Some people who are used to um, to working off the mobile phones won't touch your site if it's not mobile ready. So as far as revamping, the same things that we talked about before in starting a new project. Are also uh, also pertain to revamp. Um, so instead of you know deciding what your assumptions are, you basically your assumptions are the the functionality and purpose that you already have. So you want to confirm that that's actually right. Same usability studies. Never assume that you're right on target. Um, paper prototypes can really help sometimes when you're when you're a small company. You don't have time or money to go out and do these big research pieces and hire people to come in and, and do them. So um, you know, think creatively on how you can get these questions answered and be happy in the fact that you know you've got uh, you know a, a, an inexpensive way to do it. Um, the other question is, do you want to start from scratch, or is there code that you can reuse? Um, the, um, there was a there used to be a show called Trading Spaces, and they used to go out and um, when they redesigned somebody's room, they took everything out of the room first, and then they designed the room. Some of the things would come back in, and some would not. But the goal is to look at this fresh, um, instead of putting band aids on it. Um, you spend a lot of money creating what you already have, and that you know, and you've got to recognize that, but also try to make the best experience. Um, Devs and designers also need to discuss strategy. Um, again, same point with breakpoints. The content is the thing that determines what those breakpoints are. Whether you're talking about a, a breakpoint where the site changes in responsive, or whether you're talking about a new template, you know, in an adaptive circumstance. Um, and uh, you know, that's kind of where that goes. Uh, web apps determine if you need different versions of the app. Go ahead. Um, and one thing that and one thing that, that might be a deciding factor when you're revamping the project, whether it's, you know whether you're going to have to like just take everything out of the house and then put it back in slowly, um, take a look at your especially with web applications, but it also applies to websites. Take a look at how modular the the application was set up initially. The more modular it was all set up, the easier it's going to be, right? Because then you're going to be able to take modules and reorganize them more easily. If the application was really set, and you know, a lot of these, a lot of the web applications that are going to that you're going to be looking at revamping have been around a long time, and they're probably not going to be optimally modularized. Um, that that's that's going to be a big deciding point, right? Because if they're not really modularized, it's going to be a lot more difficult to just simply try and reuse code instead of like just taking it all out of the house and putting it back in. Excellent. And we're going to move on in just a second. Um, but Michael was asking about how you determine breakpoints. Is it by percentage or is it a specific pixel point? Um, it depends on how you're, you're actually like measuring everything on your site. Um, when you're actually creating this thing, you will use pixels or you will use percentages as, as those, those um, uh, increments, the measurements. Yeah. But um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I, I personally, once you've decided where your break, you know, the first thing you need to do is figure out where your breakpoints are going to be, just, just without, you know, without worrying about what, what the units are. 
you're going to kind of like look at if it's a website as as um, as Brian pointed out you're going to look at the content and decide okay you know this this is you know kind of this is a mobile device this is a tablet and kind of imagine your content in the, each of those devices and once you've decided that and you figure out where the breakpoints should be based on the content not based on necessarily the device but based on the content and how it would look in the, each of the devices then you kind of start you, then you start then you start measuring it and um, if it's easier for you to think in pixels, maybe you measure them out in pixels and come with your baseline pixel. I would recommend that when you actually code up your breakpoints, that you code them that then you code them in M's, is what I do. Yeah, yeah. M's, which are which are relative fonts. Yeah, Rel yeah. relative fonts. Based on the on the width, that's great. Um, and uh, Hill asked a quick question: Is ASP.NET MVC um, web applications cons uh, are they considered highly modular modularized? Depending on how they're architected, um, it's you know using the MVC pattern, you've gone a long way to at least making sure that the different areas of your application, as far as you know, like the the model and the UI, but the UI itself doesn't necessarily, depending on you know how it was coded up, the UI itself doesn't necessarily have to be modularized. Um, it's hopefully, uh, hopefully they would have designed the UI components so that they're these separate components. But they, it would really. So the answer is no, not just by itself. It, I wouldn't say that the UI is modularized. The MVC has gone a long way to taking care of other parts of the application and making sure that they're in their own um, domains. Um, but I, but those domains don't necessarily and probably don't at all really map over to the response of nature of making sure that you're targeting different devices. Thank you, Mark. Here are a couple of examples. So this is basically going from one, um, you know, again, this is, uh, you know, a site that was not ready for uh, you know, tiny buttons, tiny type, it's not ready for mobile, and trying to uh, turn it over. This could be adaptive or it could be responsive. Here's another example. Again, some things uh, still do shrink things down just so they fit in the screen. So the other cool thing here is when you're doing, when you're revamping your site, as long as you're revamping it and you're trying to make things match, your design has an opportunity to change and actually, you know, be better. Um, and it's just as long as you're, as long as you're going ahead and repainting the room, you might as well put a new carpet. Okay. Here, Give it after you finish painting. After. <laughs> that's right. Here's a. Uh, Here's a, it depends on the paint. Here's um, an example of how, um, how different devices could be, um, could be managed as far as uh, different resolutions. Um, it's just an example. It's not, there, I wouldn't put things down to um, specific numbers as to where the breakpoints come in. Again, that's content based. Okay. So, um, Mark, why don't you hit this one? Okay. Yeah, so um, from a technical perspective, there, there are a handful of techniques that have already been um, widely used and are being widely used um, to handle uh, responsive design. Um, media queries uh, in the style sheets, you have media queries that you can set and easily, to easily apply different styles depending on a variety of different factors. Most notably with responsive is often screen size. Um, but you're not limited to that. You're also you also have um, orientation. Um, uh, yeah. There's there several different several different media queries that can be applied. Um, another thing is to make sure that you use proportional sizing and layout. So make sure that your content regions are using like percentages instead of like actual number of pixels or whatever, and that your fonts are using um, M's or or another um, proportional. Uh, type of unit instead of like pixels or, or um, points or something like that that aren't proportional. Um, with images and videos, try to make sure that you keep them flexible, right? So don't, you know, don't hard code your widths in for your images. Um, make sure you use max width when appropriate. Um, and then uh, you'll want to find, you'll either want to develop for yourself or find one already out there. You'll want to find a fluid grid to lay out your your content. Um, we'll, we'll talk about grid systems in a little bit. The, a fluid grid will, will go a long way to helping make your life a lot better. Um, and then you'll want to focus on progressive enhancement instead of graceful degradation. And so what that means is, you know, you want to make sure that you look at what the least common denominator can do 
and then as you get more capabilities, add to it. That way, so what happens if you use graceful de degradation as your approach to doing responsive web design? What you end up doing is the mobile, the mobile device, for example, which is the least capable of all of them, it gets all of the content and then decides what not to use. Right, so it has to do like this extra work. If you focus on progressive enhancement, then you only start giving additional things that, th that can actually be used to devices that have the greater capability. So that mobile device, for example, where, where that's least capable, it only gets what it needs. And only if that you go above that do you get like additional resources. So, um, and mobile, if you use a mobile first design approach, it'll, it'll really help you in, in like staying focused on progressive enhancement as opposed to graceful degradation. You'll, you'll lose less doing the, doing the mobile first. It's easier to add things in than take things out. Um, uh, progressive enhancement, and they, they call it um, semantic HTML markup. So basically find out, you know, where it's going and then it, it marks up, you know, based on that. And um, how I define like graceful degradation is, it looks great when you've, you know, when you have the device it's programmed to, and the smaller it gets, the more it looks like crap. Or the um, the browsers um, that it's set for. And I, I, in the old days, we used to really focus on how this looks in Internet Explorer, how this looks in Netscape years ago on all sorts of different browsers. And in this case, you can actually do a lot more um, that's more universal. It's a huge savings in time. Uh, so Brian asked, in addition to adaptive responsive design optimization for various screen sizes, how does responsive adaptive design optimize for additional inputs, interaction points um, for mobile and tablet, uh, like um, swipe and touch, et cetera? Um, yeah, so, so responsive design on, it, on its own, uh, did, um, responsive design on its own won't do that for you. Responsive design is going to help you actually with the, the layout and positioning and sizing and everything of the, of the content that's on there. there. There are libraries out there that take advantage of the capabilities of HTML5, however, that allow you to focus on different types of event, de de events depending on what type of content you're presenting. So it's not just going to be the responsive web design part. You're also going to have to take a look at um, the uh, the, the JavaScript and the HTML5 um, stuff that you're using to make sure that you're also looking at those because you know the same media queries that you use in, in for style sheets to figure out that you're on like a certain dimension that sa that same approach can be handled in JavaScript so you can you can determine what kind of input device you're on and then have your programming target different events. So on the desktop, you might be looking for the, for the mouse click on a particular link where you're looking at um, some touch event if you're on a certain, a certain size. So you can, take, you can take advantage of the input that you get from the responsive approach, but you're going to have to like, apply it to additional programming resources to make, to make the input part of this equation come into effect. And a lot of the libraries that are out there that are available give you a lot of that infrastructure just out of the box. So you, you already get it and you just have to apply it to what you're working on. So we're going to go on. We're actually running a little over time, so we're going to get to a few of these things. Here are fluid grids. Uh, fluid grids, for example, will actually, you, you create them and then you, um, with a fluid grid, when they're dealt with percentages, um, you can use them across different platforms, um, different resolutions. And, and the basic reason, if you're not using grids, that you want to use grids, is that um, even in any sort of design, even if it's not responsive, lining things up, creates order where there necessarily where there isn't necessarily any so it's really important to kind of line things up uh, design wise um, it, the so basically the grid is recreated by the images by the text by the titles by the buttons because they follow that same pattern it looks more organized it's a lot a lot more um, uh, professional looking and um, and when you have um, fluid uh, it allows you to stretch that grid to make everything proportionate, just like the fonts, just like the images. A really quick question um, we had uh, from Michael was, uh, would converting icons to SVG files and then um, CSS controlled fonts be an example of pr progressive enhancement? Um, yeah, I, I don't know that it's necessarily progressive enhancement, but it's definitely a good responsive um, idea, especially now to rely on fonts. Fonts are a much a much more preferred way of displaying icon material um, because they're they're lighter weight, 
they resize really easy, you can style them really easily, so there, there's just a lot more you can do with them without having to go through all the overhead of additional images. Um, but I don't know that I don't know that I would. The reason I'm kind of hedging on the progressive enhancement thing is because you're you're getting the same thing on every device, right? You're getting that same font set on every device. It's just that it's kind of optimized so that you can easily use that font set to to have a have a display that looks that that looks like you want it to look on a mobile device as well as on a desktop device. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions backing up, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold these so we will answer them. But let's just go on just so we uh, get this finished. So, but I can I can give a I can give a really good example of of um, progressive enhancement. There's a new is it picture? I think the picture tag. It's still a proposed tag for HTML5, but there are um, there are um, 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 polyfills that they have available for the picture element. And what the picture does is within the picture you specify a number of different image tags in there and they're marked up with what what um, screen size that they're targeting so that the mobile device doesn't have to get like the big picture and then like figure out if it needs a different picture or it needs to resize that big picture. It actually only gets the picture that was marked up for its screen size. So that would be an example I think of, of uh, progressive enhancement in that the mobile device only gets the photo that was optimized for mobile experience, whereas the desktop can get like the big full blown high res nice. version. Okay. Nice. No, that's great. Excellent. Um, devs and designers working together. Okay. So uh, Mark and I are uh, examples of this, and and we like to, you know, basically get we get ideas off of each other, and uh, and underst understanding what the other one's limitations and um, breadth is are, are really important. So um, communication and empathy um, are the key. So basically trying to understand what it is the other person is dealing with. What are, what are the problems they're dealing with? One of the problems is not necessarily that something can be done or can't be done. It's the amount of time it takes and how much time you have for the project. So agile practices and short interactions can help um, collaboration. Um, and help keep a project moving forward. So, you know, um, cutting everything down into bite-sized pieces and actually meeting about it and making sure that everything's going, going properly it really makes things easier, just kind of working together. Um, and uh, collaborative opportunities. So Mark put a couple down here that are pretty cool. Um, you know, if, if the, when we're talking about paper, paper prototyping and making very simple things, whiteboarding, you know, can be an example. Having the um, developers actually work in that as well, because normally that's something that's done by the um, UX designers and working or the um, um, information architects. Having people work together makes them really understand and have more say in how things work. The communication is working better. Um, and then... Uh, Mark was also saying here, you know, um, regular pairing sessions. So we've done, Mark and I have, you know, we've taught before to a, to a group. We've kind of uh, talked to them about process. And we pair people up a lot of times so that they can work together to understand what the other one's doing, not just with the prototyping, but also actually in the creation piece, just to get some ideas together of how they're doing it. Plus, and that'll, you know, that'll give the opportunity for the UX designer to, to communicate directly to the dev the kind of things that they want. And it gives the developer an opportunity to talk back to the UX designer and say, oh, that, you know, that's difficult or I don't know how to do that. Or, you yeah. know, they can work those kinds of things out. And it's, it's a good learning opportunity for both. Um, it, 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 I love pairing. Completely. And, and the other thing is just... Um, the more that the more that a, a UX designer, a lot of times, you know, there's kind of that um, uh, that stereotypical, you know, um, cat and dog kind of thing, a relationship between a, a designer and a, a, you know, and a dev. And a lot of times it's like both of them are thought of as arrogant, you know, in their own way. Um, trying to understand, you know, from a UX standpoint, trying uh, design standpoint, trying to understand what code is and and how it works and how things are put together in divs how you know those kind of things can really help in the communication and it can really help um, people to kind of respect each other so mobile first development we talked about this we're almost done you guys um, mobile first development we talked about this um, we talked about again embracing the spirit of progressive enhancement um, uh, you know Mobile first, it takes the absolute bare minimum and you focus on that first, okay? That allows you to figure out, you know, what do we absolutely need for this? Um, that's really important. Um, and uh, focusing on the minimalistic environment. It helps in uh, making the, the um, user interface 
really strong and powerful. It sets those rules up. Sometimes you can you can um, do much better, stronger design with fewer elements to to establish a base. It's a like a brand, and then apply it to a larger piece. Um, and allows consideration for how um, to best take advantage of increased capability of form factor changes. So you know, the more you can do, you know, the the bigger the space, the 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 you know, the more um, advanced that piece is um, that you're using the device is, the more you can actually take advantage of that, which is helpful. Okay, using existing frameworks. Mark is here. Uh, so there's a couple of things that if you wanted to just you know go back to your desk and like start trying stuff out, um, the two responsive web design frameworks that are really popular, the big the big beast on the block is Bootstrap. Um, used to be called Twitter Bootstrap because it was developed for Twitter. Um, I highly recommend you know going grabbing Bootstrap and kind of working through some of the stuff. There's plenty of tutorials out there. Um, see about applying some of it on especially on some of like your website content pages just to see how easy or difficult you think that might be. Um, it's pretty enlightening. It's pretty easy to use. I actually prefer Foundation. Um, it's a, a rival to Bootstrap. It's not quite as well known, um, but I really enjoy the API and the look and feel of it and some of the additional components that, that Foundation provides right out of the box. But both of them are very good, very easy to use, nice and extensible, um, and especially if you don't have a design team who's going to be there to um, get a get a nice framework up for you. These are good starting places for 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 folks to get to get their feet wet. And the nice thing about it is it saves it it saves a lot of time. You can actually get things looking really clean right from the start. The problem, uh, one of the potential problems, is that you can look like everybody else's site. So and that's less balance. that's less true with Foundation than it is with Bootstrap, simply because Foundation isn't as popular. But yeah, that's great. That's great. And, and there's a and you know Bootstrap has a very very large theming environment, so you can get a lot of free and paid themes to to like make your Bootstrap not look so Bootstrappy. Similar to how WordPress has just you know a whole bunch of different templates you can add to right. it as well. And and that's great. And I mean basically the the way you look at it is when 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 you look for a car. If you go for a car that you know it's the only one on the block, it's going to be hard to find parts for it. It's going to you know it'll be hard to find someone to fix it if it gets damaged to get accessories for it. If you get something that's a little more popular, you have to do a little more work to actually make it look more unique potentially. But um, you get the support, you get um, you get the things that you need. You know it's not obsolete, so that's helpful. And using an existing framework. Yeah, so using a, you know the benefits you get from using an existing framework is they are very very complete, they're extensible, they're frequently updated. There's wide support, so it's easy to find people with the skill set when you need to hire hire on. Um, and there's a nice ecosystem of free and paid theming. Um, the issues that you're going to have is the wide appeal of the of the frameworks is going to lead to similarity. Um, the feature set is great until it's not, right? As soon as there's something that you need it to do that it doesn't quite do out of the box and you can't find a plugin for it then it can sometimes be challenging to get into that API and make it do what you want it to do. Not impossible, but you know, you've got to expend some resources on doing that. Um, and the, the final issue is it might not allow creatives to shoehorn their ideas into the opinionated framework. Because Bootstrap and, and Foundation, they are opinionated. They, they kind of want you to do things a certain way so that things work out. So, so what do you do if you've got problems with existing frameworks? You can make your own. True. Yeah. And so making your own framework, you know, you've got complete control, complete ownership, and it'll be designed exactly how the creative idea, the creative's ideas had in mind. Um, the issues are going to be, of course, you're going to have to do it all yourself, so that's additional resources. Um, you're not going to benefit from the large number of participants that things like Bootstrap and Foundation have. So, I mean, you've got, like, people using it and working on it all the time, so when there are bugs or things that don't work quite right or new browsers come out that kind of break things, there are people there to go ahead and make those fixes for you, and you just have to get the new version. Um, and onboarding new people is going to be more difficult because, you know, while it's easy to find people who've got experience with Bootstrap, your custom-made thing, that's, you know, it's, they're not going to necessarily be experienced with it, and they're going to have to be trained for it. So that currently is, uh, that's the presentation we wanted to uh, present. We've got some questions. So I know um, we've run we've run about 15 minutes over, but um, we have some questions, um, and we can answer those. So one of the questions is, um, how much UX, how much uh, is a UX designer important in the process of website development? 
Um, that's a good question. I think that, um, well, obviously they're the most important, important person in the process, right? Sorry. <laughs> Um, I can, you know, I can speak from a developer. You know, since yeah. I work mostly with government, we don't generally have UX people or, or dedicated UX people on the on on the, the the on the the projects that I work on, and it shows. And and they're like they're so, so not only does it show in like the quality of the application that you're putting out there, and if you know if you're trying to sell something, if you've got like a public facing site, then that's um, a lot more important to you than like an internal government application. Yeah. But you know. You get the usability studies. You get um, you get components already like pre, you get like a whole you could have a whole library of components that would like speed up development time if the developers don't have to like develop those kinds of things on the fly. So I think UX designers often get a short shrift, but I think that I think they're very important. I think you need to have you need to have I'm you know I'm not sure exactly what the breakdown on a particular team would be, but I definitely think you want to have like you want to have a few UX designers, dedicated UX designers available. And, and a lot of the overall, the overall um, course of the project. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 a lot of teams, UX is like the development can be um, some real heavy lifting, and the UX can actually be a, a small portion in the beginning, setting it up um, so that the the project is is started right from a UX standpoint, and the developers take over, and then the UX people can be for you know used for support. But um, they're really important, and you know they they're actually relatively inexpensive. If you think about it that way, but um, the the whole goal here also is I, we've seen a lot of things that have been developed by um, you know, created by developers, and the UX is done by developers. Um, it, it's uh, when you say you're not the user, and you're doing it from a you know from a user centered design standpoint, and a developer puts things together, it, it can be real messy. I mean, it it can be very cold and and not very user friendly. Um, you know, if you have someone who who understands UX from a development standpoint, that's a, a great thing. But it's it's um, it's really helpful to have. So we have, let's see, another question. Um, showing Illustrator. This is for the grids that we talked about. Um, why not Dreamweave a responsive grid design? Um, absolutely, absolutely. This is this is for when we were creating the those uh, pieces. They were more focused on. Uh, a design standpoint of actually creating things in Illustrator or Photoshop, and so that's what we were doing the design elements in. Then we bring them into um, into the uh, the HTML part. Yeah, you know, and now you could actually you could actually you know with something like Bootstrap or Foundation, you could actually do in browser um, grid layout stuff because they come with grids already programmed in, and you just have to code. Your HTML with you know with what with what I think we lost you more right? element that you're putting on there. So what's that? I think we lost you for a second. Oh, I was just saying that you know with Bootstrap or Foundation, you you have a grid system that will even allow you to do HTML um, prototyping without needing to go to Photoshop if necessary. I mean, you've got like the grid that you can start laying out stuff immediately. Exactly. Um, John was also um, adding to our, our piece about SVG, said on some platforms SV, SVG doesn't work. Great point. Um, you're doing H, HTML, CSS, um, JavaScript. Um, so it's uh, talking about making sure that we're focused on the right tool. All right, we got uh, Ken. Just a few more questions. Ken said, in your projects, what is the difference between what the UX designer does and what an, um, uh, an IA does? So um, it, they can, it, they're, they're very similar roles and sometimes they can be the same. The UX designer can do some of the work of the um, information architect, um, but it kind of depends. Um, the, the thinking on how, um, how the UI is actually set up and how, um, how the hierarchy is set up, um, you know, what best practices are, those are all part of an interaction. Uh, excuse me, an information architect. And uh, sometimes they cross over between roles. A lot of times they do. Um, it, it's kind of one of those things Mark was just talking about having, being able to, you know, have a team that actually has a UX designer. Um, same thing. Having an information architect um, is a great luxury to be able to have to, to make sure that things are really balanced and focused. But there's a lot of overlap between the two. Awesome. We have, Lori was asking, um, how can you make adaptive adaptive design work for Android mobile devices? How can you make 
Android mobile devices. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question necessarily. Um, do you, are we saying that we want to make an adaptive site that only targets Android? Um, yeah, that's the question because because in general there shouldn't be a, there shouldn't be a problem. So if we're talking about adaptive, um, well, that's the question. It, what what is, is, you know, what mean? generally happen what what generally happens when, and you know, again, I'm assuming a web application here, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not assuming a, um, uh, you know, I'm not assuming a native application. So, assuming a web a web application, all devices send information about what type of device they they are. So you just need to make sure that you set up your server to identify the type of request that's coming in, and then assuming adaptive, where you know adaptive in my mind, adaptive is where you marshal people to different um, different applications depending on what they are. You would then just marshal them to uh, the new site. So, for example, with like with Wikipedia, they don't specifically target Android devices, but they take a look at the information to see if they're coming from a mobile device. Um, and then they marshal it over to the m.wikipedia.com um, URL to dis display that information to them. And if not, then let them go through to the wikipedia.com site. You would do a similar thing where you would query the header information, the HTTP header information, and determine where to marshal people depending on what kind of content you wanted to show them. Excellent. Now, Excellent. if you're You're fuzzing out, Mark. If you're in charge of the native application, then you can just simply make sure that your native application can be used to rock that. Awesome. Awesome. What's that? That's great. You were fading out for a second. You're back. You're back. Okay. Let me pop the, the last slide here real quick. Um, uh, we've got one more question, um, but before you answer that, um, just want to say thank you for everybody to come uh, for coming. Sorry we ran a little over. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to um, talk more about this and, and maybe take advantage of, of our services, um, Contact Kelly Peterson at rampgroup.com. We'll be sending a follow-up email out to everyone. Let us know what it is that you'd like help with, and we'll get right back to you. Um, it's been really helpful to kind of talk through this, and uh, um, it's great to hear kind of where other people are coming from. So one of the questions we have is, how important is a UX researcher in your process? And we actually missed that in the, you know, in the team. Um, this is not uh, the, the UI designer um, who does usability testing or research, but a dedicated resource um, who does the usability testing and um, uh, monitoring. Um, uh, it's a person who works with the with a, a UI designer. Um, in my in my view, a UX um, a UX researcher is really important in in making sure it, it gets more in depth and actually focuses more on that, you know, on the usability direction, where people are coming from. So the research is coming from studies. The research is, is coming from, use, you know, usability studies that you're creating. It's from past studies. It's from actually going out and getting the information. Um, and and that's, uh, that's a big deal. I worked at Microsoft, and when we did usability studies, um, we would have, you know, user researchers who would actually put those together and did a solid job. They usually had a lot of focus in, you know, um, human computer interaction and really knew um, a lot about kind of the psychology of things and how they worked. Um, so the answer is they're very important in the process. Yeah, I, I strongly agree with that. You, you, um, you, UX researchers are a highly underutilized resource. Yeah, I agree. Um, Elaine was just saying uh, he was not fading for us. So, so Mark, you were still there. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so will you send a recording to everyone who attended? The answer is yes. We're going to post it up, and then we're going to send everyone an email with the location of that. Um, does anybody have any other questions they want to ask? Mark? Thanks, man. Um, it's always great working with thank you, you sir. Um, even though you're not about pretty. And uh, everybody, thank you very much for joining. This has been great. Um, we'll be doing more webinars. Um, we're available if you need more help, if you need to kind of talk about where you want to go. Go ahead and take advantage. Um, go ahead and contact Kelly. We'll be sending follow-up emails to everyone. And uh, everyone, have a great day. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Take care.